Uh, and uh, thanks for coming out. I hope you guys had fun. Uh, one last note, visit the website, sciencecafesf. What is one note for this section? We're going to, we're a little behind on the number of slides, so we're going to limit the number of questions until we get to the, to the part on what, how you can get involved, because as Melissa said, that's a little more fun. So just picking up where we left off um, in the, the energy uh, sector, existing reductions, 13%. We think we've achieved 13% of those below the business as usual scenario. Next, next slide. This is a real interesting one. This is what we think we can get with renewables. And where, what this figure is based on, you see it's a very tiny little sliver, 1%. And what this figure is based on is the city has something called the uh, Electricity Resource Plan that was put out just before the Climate Action Plan. And it called for us establishing um, 31 megawatts of renewable power in the city. We have uh, three, three or four megawatts right now, and that's all of the rooftop PV, um, I guess that's, that's about it, but, but essentially if we, <laughs> oh, we have one rooftop uh, wind turbine too. Um, going to be too soon. And uh, this is if we were to go from the three megawatts that we have now to the full 31 megawatts called for an electricity resource plan, it would only get us this much of the reductions that we need to make. And um, if you go ahead and put up the next, the next slide. Oh, this is cool. This is the SF solar map. You can plug in your address and find out what your, your solar capacity is on your roof. It's a nice resource. Um, it's just sf.solarmap.org. So you should all check it out. Next, next slide. So what this next piece of the pie is, is something called the, the RICO update. And RICO is Residential Energy Conservation <laughs> Ordinance. It's something we already have. And essentially, what it does is it, it requires certain energy efficiency at, at time of sale of your house. And this is, a, this is an update to it that we're currently working on trying to get through along with the cities of Berkeley and Oakland. And on the sort of back of the envelope calculations, we thought we could get this very significant um, piece of the pie through just updating this ordinance. Comparing that to renewables, it seems clear that, that energy efficiency is really, really important. And uh, I want to stress again with that, that it's important to think about time frames, because I don't want you to get the message that Renewables aren't important, but in the near term, efficiency, efficiency, efficiency is what is what we need to get at. And we need to have renewable projects and invest in them and get that technology to work, but not at the expense of doing the efficiency in the near term. Because ultimately, the more efficient we are, the easier it is going to bring to bring renewable sources online. To the end of renewables, what is the city of San Francisco doing? Hang on one second, I'll bring the mic over. What is the city of San Francisco doing to change the legislation so that PGE has to buy power back rather than I put solar panels on my roof and I just put it up up there and I'm just metering and I just put it up there. Yeah, uh, Danielle, do you want to answer that question? <laughs> yeah, that, that's a... It, um, that's a huge question. I mean, I, I would guess that you're probably aware of how huge that question is. Maybe rather than me trying to fumble through and answer to it, you could just sort of state what you think we should be doing. <laughs> tell, tell me what we should do. That's the first time I've ever heard somebody from the government say that. <laughs> I, in some way, I should be able to put more solar panels on my roof. I mean, I have solar panels on my roof. I just put it up up there so that the time of use metering generates just enough power to cover my power bill. Um, if I could put more solar panels on our roof, as well as you know, start working towards that million roof campaign that the state of California was working towards, it would allow people to more easily afford to put solar panels on the roofs. There are tons of roofs out there, right? 
not only across the city, but across the state. And if there are financial reasons for people to do it, you're going to find it much easier to get people to tell the business side of the rules and, and raise that level of interest. Yep. Next slide. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, no, I, I mean, it's, it, it's, it's challenging. I mean, part of people may not be fully aware of what one of the things you're talking about is in San Francisco, because of the way our, our um, power is distributed through the city, there's restrictions on how much, how much renewables you can put on your roof. And the, the logic behind it from the utility is that there's um, reliability issues if the system gets overloaded with um, excess power coming from these distributed generation systems then it could take out whole sections of the, the city. And there, there's a lot of debate about how legitimate that is and what could be done to change that. And and yeah, you're right, there's a lot that, that needs to happen in that direction to, to realize um, what the true potential for, for renewables is. What does the contract say with PG? Sorry? What does the, the contract say? Oh uh, yeah, you're getting out of my out of my area expertise. Do you know what the contract says? Yeah. yeah. All right. So let's get to the fun part. Now. Um, Energy Watch and uh, commercial ordinance is Energy Watch is actually a program run by Ann Kelly, who's here today, and it's um, geared towards multifamily residential buildings and small commercial and essentially what what happens is we go in and do energy audits and provide incentives and rebates to, to do energy efficiency and again energy efficiency very important the commercial ordinance um, would be banning t12 lighting in commercial buildings and we think we can get some significant reductions for that the next is uh doing some pretty aggressive solar hot water the numbers are are fairly small on that end. Next. New green building. This is this is a conservative estimate of what we could get out of green building. It's um, right right now we're doing some incentives where doing prior, priority permitting for uh, lead gold buildings for commercial and it has actually um, spurred a, a lot more interest in it in doing um, are people familiar with lead leadership and energy and environmental design. It's basically the, the gold standard for green buildings. Actually, they have gold. It's a green building program. And it's, it's, there's different degrees to which you can um, implement it. But essentially, what this, this slide shows is that if we were to require a certain amount of lead gold in new buildings, we get these reductions. But actually, there's a lot of potential in our existing building stock to get reductions from from through green building in renovations. We just haven't been able to quantify that at this point. Just uh, people may have seen the California Academy of Sciences, which is going to be the largest public lead. Uh, platinum building in the country, so I would encourage you to go visit it once it's up and operational. This is a sketch of Treasure Island, and which is we're in the process of working on a development plan for that's um, aimed at being fairly sustainable. Question. Yeah. Uh, Newman. <laughs> <laughs> level rise, do you think, given what the scenarios are, that they're actually going to build it? And the sh short answer is yes. Um, they are. They have had pressure put on them to look at the sea level rise issue, and they've been doing some things in the design phase to uh, to incorporate future, future sea level into it. Um, 
certainly if we go the route that yeah, I mean, there's, there's a lot of engineering things that you can do. Obviously not to address 20-foot um, sea level rise. Uh, but, you know, it's, and it's not stilts. So it's, you know, about building up the perimeters of the island. Um, I, you know, what I would say is I hope that in addition to building treasure islands, that they're using that as a place to um, be a center of trying to reduce emissions for their own benefit, for their own enlightened self-interest. But yeah, it's, a, I mean, it's an interesting. Uh, <laughs> it's residential, high-rise residential. And lastly, this is our other category, which takes us through the rest of the electricity emissions. And this is sort of a catch-all. There's a lot of programs that we're working on. Um, we have, I talked to somebody on the break about the Business Council on Climate Change, which is an effort for us to go out to the business community and get them to make climate commitments. We, um, you know, the, this whole pie chart doesn't factor into what we could do with electricity if we were actually able to purchase 100% green power products in the city. There may be you know, something along those lines on the uh, horizon. Also, combined heat and power was not captured elsewhere. The utility programs on energy efficiency were not captured elsewhere. So there's a lot in that other category. And next. Oh, um, this is Moscone Center. And I put this in that other category because it's not really about renewables. It's actually sort of more about efficiency. So you can see, Danielle would be very happy because she worked on this project and everybody pays attention to the solar powers on the roof, but under the roof there was a huge lighting retrofit which got 800 kilowatts of efficiency and essentially made, the, made this a cost-effective project for the photovoltaics. So again, efficiency is really important. This is a Ed Masria slide and this goes to um, the significance of buildings, and I won't say much more on that. Uh, question? Yeah, just to clarify, so is efficiency different from conservation efforts? Oh, well, that's a great that's a great point because actually, if there's a loading order for these things, conservation would be first. You know, first don't don't use the energy. Efficiency tends to mean you're using more efficient products. Um, and you're doing, you're getting more out of the, the energy that you are using. But yeah, that's a great, that's really important to note too. Oh, you know, there's a lot of just waste out there. Like for instance, well, we don't have to go into it, but um, this, this I kept for last. This is our reductions from, from uh, the waste sector. And we are, San Francisco has a real success story here. We have one of the highest uh, rates of diverting waste from the landfill in the country. We, um, the, you know, believe it or not, the food waste composting program is really, really progressive. We're actually committed to being zero waste, um, and we're we're working on. There, there's really interesting aspects to that, which are essentially there's only a certain amount of the waste right now that can be recycled or composted, and the rest of it, we have to work with the producers, the manufacturers, the packaging people to figure out how we get them to not produce stuff that, that can't be composted or, or um, recycled. So it, it's pretty interesting, but it, it, I think you should have a science cafe on composting. Uh, next slide. It's like the Ford Science Cafe. <laughs> Um, uh, next slide. So just on the, on the waste thing, uh, how many people here actually are composting or have access to composting? Great. Right? It's, it's um, pretty interesting. There's a, a lot of issues that you start to get into when you look at the, the waste sector. And there, you know, there's land, there's an effort right now by companies that run landfills to start to try to get credit for their landfills. There's a certain amount of sequestration that happens when waste gets locked into the landfill. 
Um, so there are at least companies that think, oh, we're, it's like we're making the forests. And there's sort of a battle going on in the state about that between the zero waste people, because ultimately we don't want this stuff to go to the landfill, even if it's a well-managed landfill where they're recovering the methane. We, you know, we want it to go to composting facilities that are well run, and then that compost can go back and be used um, to in a local food system. So our our department's pretty interested in how they think about waste, and I would encourage you to to visit our website and and um, start to get, think a little bit more about the connections between waste and climate change. But this stuff does get very complex, and the next slide is actually just really what it comes down to. So. <laughs> we'd all be better off if we just bought less. That's a great rule of thumb. Like in every food, you know, hot pockets. Beer does not count as beer. Beer, so beer. Yeah, beer is good. <laughs> and then finally, there's a lot we need to do beyond the plan. Um, the, the plan is great, but it's a starting point. After 2012, you know, what do we do? This adaptation question we're starting to look at and um, how do we, as a city, really institutionalize our approach to climate change? It shouldn't be something that we're bugging people about or just tacking on. That has to be part of how we do business. There's a lot of areas that we didn't look at. Again, this ties to the composting thing. Food, our, you know, if you think about our transportation system that it takes to get our food here and the emissions that are in, embedded in that and combine that with what's going to happen when we run out of cheap oil, there's some pretty scary scary propositions. And we also, you know, we need resources dedicated to, to this stuff. And I, when I say we, I don't just mean the city. I mean, in general, investors have to start thinking, you know, there's a lot of venture capital right now that is going into clean tech and that kind of thing. But the level of investment that's going to need to happen to get us to this decarbonized future is going to have to be really, really huge. So um, San Francisco, we got to have a lot of wealthy people, so we just need to get them investing in the right places. And the point of this is San Francisco is just one city. So if we reduce our emissions by 20% below 1990 levels, that's great, but that's not going to change you know, global warming. That's not going to stop global warming. But that being said, people are paying attention to us. We are San Francisco. So we've got a reputation for being environmental and progressive. We've set this target, we've put it out there. It sounds a really bad message if we if we don't meet it or if we don't even try to meet it. But ultimately that's gonna take take everybody. Um, you know, the city itself can only directly control a certain amount of the emissions. So so we need everybody to be working on this. But, so that's the end of my official city city part of the presentation. So, um, hear me? No. <laughs> but yeah, maybe a few more. Uh, if there's a question or two on that. Um, I just want to ask, uh, in terms of efficiency, have you calculated the cost of uh, having to replace and dispose of all the existing materials and existing and the cause of manufacturing those new products, have you calculated that? No, I, I mean, I haven't done that. I haven't actually even seen that kind of analysis. That was, the, the question was, in terms of efficiency, if the costs uh, have been calculated of, you know, replacing all these products that, you know, that are being phased out that more. But, and, and no, and I, and I, I don't think I've ever come across that kind of, analysis and you know part of the reason is you think I mean they're not quite as complex as the climate the models but economic models are pretty complex too and there's so many factors that that go into I would imagine it's very straightforward if you estimate how much more how much uh, longer a particular like say life fixture or the clients what's the average lifespan and how, how long is in there Oh, oh, okay. Uh, all right. So yeah, those kind of calculate. I mean, if you buy energy efficiency, energy efficient light bulbs, those 
calculations are usually right on the package, comparing it to. Oh, I'm saying in terms of uh, when you replace a uh, large, large commercial building, when you're facing out appliances and, and fixtures, that are, that still has a, a, have a certain life lifespan. Lifespan, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, but you prematurely replace it, so that you calculate that cost uh, of loss. The resources that are lost yeah. from right. throwing it away before it gets reached in the end of the right. cycle. Now, again, I haven't seen that type of analysis, but I think the trick is like with, with uh, well, one of the tricks, I suppose, is doing things at the right time. You know, so like with the, the rebuild, the residential energy conservation ordinance, it's really important that that gets done at a time of sale. Um, because that's uh, you know a period where these transactions are happening and people are making improvements, um, but I haven't seen that specific kind of analysis. I would think it would be pretty important. Otherwise, we're we are kind of almost like using the books just to achieve our goal. You know? Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, yeah, yeah. And there's you know you, know, you can play around a lot with numbers, so I I'd love to see your work on that. <laughs> <laughs> we are always looking for good good reports and background information. Can we, we'll take uh, one more question before you, sure. before the fun. I've actually got two. Okay. <laughs> um, with the energy efficient light bulbs, I was looking recently at the store and I noticed that they all say that there's mercury in them yeah. and that you have to dispose of them in a specific way. That's so right. How, how do you do that? Um, well, again, being in San Francisco, we're kind of fortunate. There's drop-off locations all all around the city um, in hardware stores and um, I know for me there's a you know I live near Chinatown and there's a center right there that takes them along with batteries and and you know recycles them but let, let me jump in for one second we actually have somebody from a group here that is sponsoring a uh, uh, they're called Lights Out San Francisco and he's I think can you talk about the actual recycling uh, of the things and the locations? <laughs> yeah, well, okay, so the easiest place to, to figure it out is we have something called a, um, it's like an eco finder. It's right on the front, the home page of our website, sfenvironment.com. And it's probably the thing we get the most hits on our website for, and it tells you where you can recycle things and where you can what can be recycled and what the nearest location near your house is and all that kind of stuff. So I would, I would use that as a resource. Yeah. The only thing I would add is how you break up how you're supposed to put it in a plastic bag and then recycle it. Yeah, so that was just, if, if you have one and it does break, put it in a plastic bag. And, and one thing too to point out on this front, because you know I am in the, the section of the Department of Environment that works on energy efficiency, and um, yes, it's true, uh, those bulbs do have mercury in them, but there was some analysis done by one of the folks in our department that actually showed the emissions that you're avoiding from the power plants are reduces more mercury than what is produced in the light bulb. So again, all these things, you gotta keep it, yeah. There's no perfect solutions there. And I think a good measure is that in one of these light bulbs, there's about 1% of what's in a thermometer. 1% one per, one of what's in a thermometer mercury loss. My other question is just that um, I had heard a while ago that San Francisco either did or planned to uh, ban plastic bags. Oh, yeah. So did that happen? Yeah, that happened. It's a, um, I don't think it's gone into effect yet, but basically large supermarkets are going to have to, um, the, the bags that they're going to give are going to be compostable. And again, it fits into this zero waste bowl and trying to figure out like, okay, these plastic bags are, you know, there's nothing you can do. You can't really recycle them. I mean, I, they do have programs to recycle them, but I think cost-wise it doesn't work out that well. So the best the best way to approach it is if we're not giving them out. So what's a replacement for that? And it's compostable bags. But yeah, that's that's how you have them. Like how soon until that's oh, going to kick in? I'm not, um, it's it's going to start soon. But actually, there's a good a good uh, comment too, which goes back to sort of this uh, loading order. Like the gentleman asked a question about conservation, but 
really the best thing is don't even get those compostable bags. Get it, bring a canvas bag, you know. I have tried to make my husband carry a small bag in his wallet, but he won't do it, so I guess the compostable bags will have to do, but but you know, if you really I mean these are the types of choices you can make, like stick a, you know, take a bag with you. I work at Trader Joe's. Oh okay. I have to grocery store every time someone's like, actually kind of plastic and like when is that long in the One more? I was just going to make a comment that if you have the choice between paper and plastic, like if that's your only choice, plastic is far better. Um, so if you do, a, if you choose plastic bags, uh, as far as uh, just energy, uh, they're about it takes about ten times less energy to produce a plastic bag. If you throw it away, the only time plastic is anywhere worse is when you throw it out the window. So if you're a jackass, then plastic bag. <laughs> but if you're uh, but if you're going to recycle. Um, it takes far, far less, about 10 times less energy to recycle plastic than paper. Uh, so, and paper's awful. It's, uh, there's so many chemicals, because when you recycle it, you have to, uh, you have to bleach it. And there's a huge amount of energy that you have to put into the slurry mixture to turn it into like a, uh, like a cardboard box or something. Whereas with, uh, paper, uh, with plastic, there is a, and they're so light, right? So you can imagine just put a tiny bit of energy in there to heat it up, and then it becomes somebody's deck. And so that's one of the biggest misconceptions, and it's kind of embarrassing, but that nobody understands this. And, and if you I mean if you care about the environment, then bring a canvas bag. I agree. I, agree. I mean I, I do all my shopping because of my backpack and my stuff. I don't have a car, but anyway. So yeah, I just follow up then. So is it is it counterproductive then that San Francisco bans like um, certain kinds of teacup containers? Because these are made of paper and they're compostable. They're compostable. Yeah. I, I haven't seen the specific analysis. I mean, and that's a tricky one, you know, like takeout. I mean, do you just not get takeout food or do you bring your own containers? I mean, you, everybody's got to look at their lifestyle, look at their choices and decide, okay, I'm willing to do this, I'm willing to do that. Maybe I'm not quite ready for this one, but, you know, everybody's got to be making those, those decisions and thinking about this stuff. Yeah, we're a little over yeah. time, so uh, we're going to continue over because this, this is really uh, one of the most important parts of the Science Cafe is how you can get involved. And there are a couple of groups here that also do work in climate change that are going to be offering an opportunity to speak. So if you're interested, stay past, and we're just going to keep going. <laughs> All right, so this is uh, how you can get involved. But first, let's talk about fish. So um, does anybody know what this fish is? Oh, nice. Okay. And um, do you know anything about the Garibaldi? They're really funny. They, well, they live in Southern California. So Gar Garibaldi, yeah, they're some Southern California species. And it's also the California State Marine Fish. So and they're bright orange and they're, they're kind of funny. Um, it's, next slide. And this is a harbor seal, and they're really cute, and they're amazing to see underwater. And this photo was actually taken by somebody. We, we went to the Channel Islands and went diving, and he took this photo on a dive. These, they, they're crazy. They play with you all the time. And they're, they're like underwater dogs. They're kind of amazing. This is the Channel Islands. It's a beautiful there, great place to go. You can just snorkel and see bat rays and tons of fish and all kinds of stuff. So the point I'm making here is I, I like going in the water, I like diving, I like um, snorkeling, and I recently had a friend who's actually in the back of the room, Doc Master Dan, can you say hi? Hey, hey. Who got, got myself and some friends involved with an organization called Reef Check. And essentially Reef Check is this international organization that started to protect the health of the coral reefs, which as you may remember are under threat from from climate change, and essentially what they did was they got recreational divers uh, to sign up and go through this training on how to do scientific surveys and count fish and, and vertebrates 
and record the data and submit it. And um, it's been an incredible success. And in the last two years, they've started doing this in California to measure the rocky reefs. And we, we went through the training, and now we get to go out and have fun and, and die, but also collect this data that's, that's really important. Um, you know, one of the reasons Reef Check was started is because there's a lack of long-term data out there. You know, typically there's not a lot of funding for academic institutions, so they may collect data for one year, and that's really not very useful, because if you want to measure the health of an ecosystem, you need, you need long-term data. So this is an example of something you can do that's a little different than a 10 things list. It's get, get involved with the science, basically. We're now recreational divers going out there, uh, being allowed to go into marine reserves, collecting this data, and actually contributing to the body of scientific evidence that, that can show um, what the impacts of climate change are. Um, so now that I'm in reef check, actually, if you go back to that Garibaldi, so I know other things now that I'm in reef check, which is there's actually like four reef check species in here. There's the Garibaldi, there's a giant spine sea star, there's uh, a crowned urchin, a purple urchin, and a bat star behind it. And they're all, oh, there's another one down there. They're all reef check species. So go move forward again. And uh, well, I just wanted to put, <laughs> you can't go to the next slide. Put this up there, because it's not all fun and games, you know, diving. You, um, you have to get into these outfits and, uh, well, these, these folks who you might recognize from the back of the room are wearing dry suits. So if you're kind of a wimpy diver, you can wear a dry suit. But, we, but you know, you can also wear wetsuits. And the water's it's cold, it's like 52 degrees. Um, so it's not all fun and games. There's some effort that goes into it. And research diving is actually kind of complica complicated compared to regular diving. But it's fun, the rewards are great. That's a California lobster. Also from the Channel Islands. Next, and this is the other thing I know um, from Reef Check is that this is a um, a male rock grass, and you get to learn fun things like the way you identify this species underwater. Is you know it's male because it has a hairy armpit, <laughs> so you get fun things like that. And this is a do you know? That's a, this is a male sheephead. You also find out interesting things like all these. Sheephead, which are about the size of a barn, are born females, and then one of them will become the alpha male in its lifetime. Oh, and this is this is the last fish picture, but this is a, a rockfish, which there's um, lots of these in California. There should probably be more, but this one's kind of a funny one. It's the kelp rockfish, and it could be a lot of different colors, but the way they tell you to identify this one is it's the fish that has a vacant look in its eye, and um, it's the only one, it's also known as the dumb bass, dumb bass, because it's the only fish, it's a good one to practice on, because you can swim right up to it, and it thinks it's blended into kelp, but then it won't swim away. So, and just the last thing on the reef check is, this data really actually, get it, this is significant, it's, it's important. Um, I don't know if people have heard, just over the last weekend, there um, a, a um, system of marine protected areas went into place in, in the central coast of California. That's part of a much larger system that's going to be in place um, over the whole coast of California. And California Fish and Game has actually signed an agreement with Reef Check to accept that that data. So that, I mean, this is important. You know, people can do stuff with the science. And um, to give you just the last illustration of how important the data is, we did go last weekend and did our first official reef check dive, and we went into a marine reserve, which you're not allowed to um, fish in there, you're not allowed, you basically, you're not even allowed to dive in there, but since we were survey divers, they allowed us to go in. And we did our whole dive, and we collected our data, and it was in this really massively thick kelp forest, so you kind of struggle, and it was surgy, and we um, were finishing the dive, and we, you wait at 15 feet below the surface, and you do 
a um, safety stop, and I looked down, and my big slate that I had to collect the data was gone. It it got knocked off my uh, year, and I was kind of disturbed by this because this is a marine reserve, and it's the last place you want to be leaving stuff behind. Not to mention a slate with your name written all over it. <laughs> <laughs> that kind of thing. But so we got on the boat, and I kind of sheepish. We went up to the instructor and I was like, she's how did that go? I was like, uh, yeah, well, I left my sleep there. And um, she, all she cared about was that we still had good data because uh, my dad buddy had collected his. So she was like, oh, don't worry. I've seen those slates under there. They get crusted over. It's like habitat. The most important thing is that you collected the data. Like, that's how important this stuff is. I could leave my sleep down there and that was insignificant as long as we had the data. These are the marine protected reserves. Where did you go? Were you in any way more? That was at um, Point Lobos. What was it? Weston was the spot. Oh, and then this is this is kind of an interest. This is again at the Channel Islands, but you notice just in the background there, there is a um, oil platform. Just kind of an interesting juxtaposition. Um, so, point being, get involved with the science. And then what I did was I just threw up a couple other other slides here. There's this is a real good one. It's real easy, and you can win cash prizes. It's the SF Climate Challenge. So it's just sfclimatechallenge.org, and it's basically an energy reduction contest. There's a, a gentleman by the name of Paul Scott, who he's an attorney by day. And he got motivated and decided he wanted to do something about climate change. So he started this, this whole effort and solely um, through volunteer time has pulled together this website and gotten um, the mayor and the board of supervisors and now just Nancy Pelosi to endorse the effort. And uh, essentially you just go to this website, you sign up, you establish a team, you sign up and then starting in October, the team that reduces the most electricity over a one month period compared to their PG&E bill from last year wins like $5,000. It's, it's easy and it's, it's a good way to kind of inspire others who maybe aren't gonna do it because of the, the climate change thing. But I would recommend everybody here sign up to the climate challenge. Grid Alternatives, another place that you can volunteer. This is a real interesting group that works in um, Bayview Hunters Point and actually installs um, photovoltaics down there. They, and they're always taking volunteers. Friends of the Urban Forest, again, a great volunteer organization. Um, get together, do a potluck, plant some trees, beautify your neighborhood, sequester some carbon. The Green Business Program, if, uh, this is an important point too, is that this stuff has to extend beyond just your, your home base. It's gotta go into your office too. So if, you know, if you're able to you know, have some sway in your office, why not try to uh, talk the boss into becoming a certified green business? Um, or if you are the boss, then shame on you if you're not part of the Green <laughs> Business Program. And another organization that we have with the, um, the Bay Area Council is something called the Business Council on Climate Change. And this is aimed at a little bit bigger firms than the Green Business Program, but essentially what we're trying to do is get uh, businesses to commit to a set of principles and then start this peer network that is so helpful when you're trying to get out there and actually make changes um, and share best practices and that kind of thing. This is our website, that's the EcoFinder right there. Again, it's um, sfenvironment.org or .com, I think they both work. Go here, there's lots of information. All the programs that I talked about, they're all detailed on here. I encourage you to visit it. And this is just the World Resources Institute, and this is um, another resource that's out there. They've put out a lot of materials on how you can reduce emissions in your office. So this is a guidebook. If you work in an office, 
this is a guidebook that you can take and walk you through step by step how to quantify your office emissions and then how to reduce them. So those are, I think that's all I have up there. And then I just thanks everybody for coming. Sorry if this was. Well, while we're, well, what we're gonna, I'm gonna cut you off first. Okay. We're gonna thank Melissa in a couple minutes, but what we're gonna do first is uh, there's actually a couple of groups that you can volunteer with here tonight that I'm gonna give them a minute to talk about what they do and how you can get involved. First up is Brian Scott from, he's the Director of Operations for Lights Out San Francisco, and he's gonna talk a little bit about his work, please. Hi. Uh, so, yeah, I'm gonna talk close to everybody. How's that, can you hear me? Uh, so Lights Out San Francisco uh, is a energy conservation event it's on October 20th here in San Francisco. Uh, next week we'll announce that another city in California will also be joining us on October 20th. And then on March 29th, we'll be doing a nationwide event with 15 cities across the nation and doing the, the same event. Um, what we're asking is that on October 20th, between the hours of 8 and 9, everybody turn their lights out for one hour. And then along with it, we're distributing 100,000 compact press and balls here in the city for free. Um, so far we've gotten uh, the city of San Francisco has passed a resolution naming it Lights Out San Francisco Day. Uh, the Golden Gate Bridge is turning their lights out, non essential lights. The Bay Bridge is turning their lights out. Alcatraz, the National Park Service, Transamerica Building, uh, Coit Tower, the, the whole city hopefully will be turning their lights out for, for businesses, non essential lights. And, you know, they're, they're not going to turn the lights out on the Bay Bridge and you can't draw it, but the tower lights will go up. Um, so, along the way, we're, we're doing energy conservation awareness. So I mean, that's the main goal of this. On the evening, we expect to you know, save between 10 to 15% of an average Saturday night's energy. But the real goal of this is to make people aware about what they can do on an individual basis to, to actually make a difference in climate change. So we're doing a great job of, of, of educating people about what's going on. So we have 100,000 light bulbs here in San Francisco to distribute. I have uh, some light bulbs here. So folks uh, want light bulbs, uh, come on up and sign up for a light bulb. Uh, if I don't have enough for everybody, I got 100,000 more of them, so we're just a light bulb. Um, and the other thing that we need is we need volunteers. Uh, we're going around the city of San Francisco, educating people about the event. More importantly, we're giving out free light bulbs to everybody who wants one, and we're giving them some education about what they can do on an individual basis. I, I think this bar could use a couple just looking up. <laughs> Uh, I also want to introduce uh, Jim Callahan. He works for Climate Change Education, and he's going to talk about his organization. Right, and um, this is the thing of making sure our organizations connect well and use our resources. Um, how about we get the guys who are friends at uh, NASA God and Space Flight Center to turn their satellites in San Francisco one the day before at the same time, the one when the lights are out, we take a picture of what it looks like when the lights are down. We can share our resources. Um, we work with um, big uh, educational institutions, and we want to have a challenge to people who love science, people who love the planet, people who work for the city and our, our local nonprofits, not to blow a great opportunity. That we can have climate science and climate solutions brimming throughout the city through our educational institutions. California Academy of Sciences, the Exploratorium, K-12 schools, of course, continue here at this wonderful place. Um, on local television, okay? Now, that is not at all way out at all, to have that major subject all the time, ongoing, big, okay? And where is that happening? Is it happening in San Francisco right now? Is it happening in San Diego? Is it happening in Berkeley? Well, we're getting there. But the place we've got to look to is San Diego, believe it or not. They've got all their museums are just covering this. The city's into it. The public is into it. The city's getting the messages out over the science museums by connecting up our nonprofits and our public and our um, in our educational institutions, we can really get the subject out in a very active, learning, very exciting way. And that's something we want you guys to know. People can volunteer. We're a volunteer organization. We've done this for eight years. Can we do better? Can we do what San Diego is doing on a small scale? Boy, can we. We don't want to just visit the California Academy of Sciences. You guys all, can, anyone who's interested, can do things at California Academy of Sciences. The largest, not just public green building, the largest green building in the country, we platinum, and will be is gearing up to draw two million visitors a year. They're quite welcome to do things on climate change. We do stuff there all the time, and we can set people up on doing all kinds of stuff. Okay? The Exploratorium is another area, one of the most renowned science museums in the, in the country, in the world, in fact. Okay? 
When we started this a long time ago, we had to do this as volunteers. Now there's money. But the money has to be sought, and it has to be run up to. We have to have the connections, like with each other, to make that happen. The Bay Area, Bay Area Air Quality Management District just announced another one and a half million dollars, which will go in the Bay Area education. We might see some of it go to Cal uh, San Francisco, but we have to have the partnerships to make that happen. But that's something you can see that all these things are fun ways, exciting ways that you can connect with kids, adults, um, you know, people, uh, young, young adult people, and things. Very exciting stuff we can all do to actively get people involved in climate change through science and education. Thanks, Jim, and thank you for, to both organizations for coming out tonight. Let's give them a, a little hand. And I'm, I'm going to give my closing spiel now before turning it back over to Melissa to maybe answer a couple more questions. Melissa said she'll stay a few minutes after if you have a question because I want to make sure everyone here has an opportunity to ask and state whatever question they have and have it answered by somebody in the city government. Because uh, honestly, in my lead up to this, I can tell how passionate the city is in talking to Melissa about uh, addressing climate change. And uh, all of us as citizens of the Bay Area should have an opportunity to ask a question and get an answer straight from the government. So I hope you take, it, take the opportunity to ask Melissa a question before the evening closes. Uh, I want to thank all of you to coming to Down to the Science tonight. This is the largest turnout we've ever had in the six months, so I appreciate you all being here and taking a part of this. Uh, we're uh, This month, it was a special month, we're on a Monday this month, but we're usually on the third Tuesday of every month, so I hope to see all of your bright, shiny faces and uh, all of your comments and questions next month. Uh, we cover topics all over the landscape, all determined by you, so I encourage you to sign uh, up for the email list and drop a suggestion in the suggestion box. And uh, again, thank you for coming. Uh-oh. <laughs> yeah. One more this thing. Is, this is not good. One more thing before we leave. <laughs> Hi, my name is Garrett. I've been friends with Keish since I was 10. Um, <laughs> Melissa, Melissa hired me, and I just want to say thank you so much. I learned so much from you during the two months before you quit after hiring me. <laughs> but, but more importantly, there's one, Keish, our, our glorious host of these events, has has one more announcement to make of a more personal nature. <laughs> yes, this, this week I've uh, exited uh, the boyfriend status and into the fiance status. <laughs> So I'm going to hand it back over to Melissa. Why don't you take a couple more questions and we'll Sure, yeah. If people have questions, I'd be happy to, to talk. Let's get a question from the left side. The left side has been quiet. Melissa, you mentioned the uh, buy less crap message. Um, I, see, I think most people can see the logic in that. But how do San Francisco businesses respond to this message? And have you have there been any efforts to help them, their businesses evolve uh, to take advantage of this? Uh, yeah, it's interesting. We have, I haven't put the buy less crap slide in a business oriented presentation. I'll have to try that next and see how they react. But it is, um, you know, we're in the very beginning stages of doing this outreach to the to the business community around this. I mean, the, the green business program's been around for a while, and that's very rigorous. The checklists that you go through to become a uh, green business are really, um, they're, it's pretty intense. And uh, I think that tends to attract businesses that have already kind of got that, that, that message, and maybe it's not specifically buy less crap, but it's, you know, a similar message. And the other thing that we're doing is um, this business council on climate change. And, you know, we haven't had the, the big kind of discussion about what, you know, sort of philosophically, it, you know, what, you know we, our whole economy is based on growth. And, um, you know, we continually get this message that we have to grow, grow, grow. The economy has to grow. And that, that probably doesn't fit well with the buy less crap. 
message. So I, I, mean, I think it's going to be real interesting over the next couple of years as we start to engage these businesses that have signed on and said, yeah, I want to do something about climate change. But as we start to get down to the real questions of, you know, well, does your business model, you know, is your whole business model at odds with that? And, you know, there's, there's no easy answers. And I think some businesses are ahead of the curve and, you know, are fortunate to be in a place where they can do that. But others, you know, are, are going to have a real tough time with it. And? Oh yeah, buy local crap. No, <laughs> buy, buy local stuff. Yes, yeah. <laughs> so, first thanks for being here, Melissa. I have two Thank questions. You. One simple, the other less so. And the first is, uh, what do you make of consumer level carbon offsets? Where oh, I go on the website, I tell them how many miles I drive, I give them $35. Yeah. Does yeah. that mean my offset, my, my carbon for my car is really offset or not? Um, I'd say probably not, but I, um, I do, I buy offsets, you know, I have one of my kind of confessional type things. It's my, you know, my family lives uh, all over the country. My parents live in Iowa, my brother lives in Colorado, my other brother lives in New York. So, you know, I, I fly and I buy offsets for those, but I think ultimately I have to fly less. But what I would say is, with, with the carbon offsets, as long as they're kind of the last, it's not, like you read these quotes from people like, I buy carbon offsets, which made me feel much better about buying my SUV, you know? And that, like, that's exactly the wrong way to do it, but it, I think it does, it's a, if you're buying from a credible, a credible organization that uses real measurement and better verification to make sure that the projects that they're talking about are happening and they're additional to what would happen if um, those that money from those offsets wasn't there, then I think they certainly don't hurt. Um, and I think there is real potential. It, you know, it's a market mechanism and there's there's real potential for there to be benefits that come out of that, but it's certainly not, it's a small part of the solution, I'd say. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, and my second question is, so sitting in a, Science Cafe talking about global warming in the middle of downtown San Francisco. I'm sure there's no one like this here, but in a lot of the rest of the country, there are people who believe that there is no anthropogenic um, global warming. We're not making the planet warmer. It's a yeah. normal climate cycle. Uh, and I, I have friends who, who are sympathetic mm -hmm. to this. What do I tell them? Um, try the peak oil argument. There's a lot of people who respond to peak oil that don't respond to climate change. Great, thank you. Uh, I'm gonna ask a question on my way over. Uh, you started off by saying, uh, here's a climate change plan, here's where we're going. Can you overall, uh, like, what's your level of confidence that we're reaching the 2012 target? Uh, I'm, I'm hopeful. Uh, you know, I'm not gonna put a number to it, and it's, it's a huge task, um, and it's it, it's going to take some real mobilization, uh, you know, on a scale that we haven't had before. But I don't, I haven't written it off. Uh, I'm hopeful. I mean, we'll, ask me again in a year. I will. You know. <laughs> <laughs> so I live in yeah, in a large apartment building, and because of that, as I'm told, the thing with recycling is outsourced. And so we do not have uh, composting and recycling programs in quite as good as it can be. So is there something that either I or the apartment can do in order to, to rectify that? And also, is there something that San Francisco can legislate so large, large uh, complexes are forced into doing more recycling? Um, yeah, that's a good question. And it comes up all the time with the composting. Um, composting issue and you know there come well although we're doing a lot on the, the composting front we haven't reached all sectors of the city yet so are you um connected at all with the other folks that live there or is, are you kind of a lone voice among the, the tenants yeah so i would, I would guess the latter then yeah, yeah. But because essentially, if you, I mean, it'll come to you, like the composting is coming to you. But if you if you want it 
that, you know, as we start to expand the program. But if you want it faster, if you were able to make some connections with your fellow tenants and, you know, send a letter to your building owner and, you know, have it backed up with, okay, an SF environment is here and they'll come in and do it, you know, that could work. Other, you know, otherwise, I think you have to, you may have to just wait till it gets to your, your neighborhood. And I, the way we try to implement these things is to hit the easiest places first. And uh, the apartment buildings are real tricky. And that, it's the same with, you know, energy efficiency where you're not paying your electric bill in your apartment. But there's different things that are happening to try to, try to address that. Okay, we're going to take one last question over here before we close, and Melissa is going to stay for a few minutes to answer questions in case you do have some questions afterwards. Uh, I just want to take a second because I forgot to thank 330 Rich for hosting this awesome event. It's so, thank you very much. And uh, ask her to put in some uh, contacts for us. <laughs> Well, let's, let's take one last question because we're so far over time. Listen, my question was actually uh, about the, the split incentive uh, as far as building owners and, and tenants go and sort of the lack of incentive for a building owner to invest in energy efficiency if those benefits will be borne by the tenant. And has, has the city come up with any ideas to address that, 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 uh, that problem, that barrier to investments in energy efficiency in building? Uh, owned by somebody separate from who, who lives there. Yeah. Um, I hate to do this, but Anna, uh, who runs that, the Energy Watch program, can you address that? Um, there is a pass-through that, that building owners can do. Uh, it's obviously imperfect because it's not working so well. So okay, that it can do. If, if there, uh, there's a pass-through that they did the past a few years ago where um, building owners can pass through energy efficiency uh, improvements in their house, uh, in their buildings, and they can pass it on or part of it um, It turns out that meeting with the, uh, the associations here that it's not, it's complicated, it's a city bureaucratic planning complication that we're trying to work on to make it uh, simpler. Um, but it, it, it is a really tricky question. That was one attempt to do it. That they, because there's a lot, been a lot of problems with not improving buildings in the city. Land owner still that, the property owners still that, you know, they're just not getting, getting their money for it. So if you have any ideas, you can pass them on. Um, you need more encouragement people who live in apartment buildings to talk to their Work together. I can actually add something to that. Sorry. Okay. Um, okay, kneel down. Um, the actually this year the board of supervisors, the PUC, brought forward rate increases. Um, as part of that negotiated agreement with the PUC, um, there is right now some staggered increases that as far as pass-throughs that could be allowed to go to a tenant. So if a landlord uh, puts in lots of different efficiencies, like new appliances, in insulation, other types of things, and it's verified by the PUC, they can then start passing through a larger percentage of energy to the tenant. So that creates, a you know, whether or not it's good or bad for the tenant, it creates an economic incentive for the landlord to do efficiency. So that is something that We'll be going back to the Board of Supervisors for, I think, final approval in Jan I think January of this year. They have the board of the PUC has to bring it back to the Board of Supervisors for approval. So that is something that is in draft form that is happening. The PUC does water, not, not energy. So I'm not sure. You're absolutely right. That's totally crazy. That was on water. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. Have a good night. Take public transit wherever you go. And we'll see you next time.